Uh, may it please the tribunal, it is my duty to present Perhaps, the case... Perhaps uh, it would be right not to go too fast if they haven't got the documents before. Yes, my lord. <coughs> it is my duty to present the case against the defendant von Parpen. Before I begin, I would like to say that the documents in the document books are arranged uh, numerically and not in the order of uh, presentation and that the English document books are paged in red chalk in the bottom, at the bottom of the page. Does, the that, mean, does that mean that the French and the, the Soviet are not? Uh, my Lord, we did not uh, prepare French and Soviet I document see. books. Mm -hmm. The defendant, von Papen, is charged primarily, as are all the other defendants, with the guilt of the conspiracy itself. The proof of this charge of conspiracy will emerge automatically from the proof of the four allegations. Uh, Mr. Barrington, uh, the French members of the tribunal have uh, no document book at all. <laughs> my Lord, there, there should be a German document book for the French member. <coughs> Lord, I understand this is now being uh, fetched by the French secretary. Yes. Should I wait until it arrives, sir? Well, I think you could go on. And, uh, <coughs> the defendant, Parpen, is charged primarily with the guilt of conspiracy, and the proof of this charge of conspiracy will emerge automatically from the proof of the four allegations specified in Appendix A of the indictment. These are as follows. One, he promoted the accession of the Nazi conspirators to power. Two, he participated in the consolidation of their control <coughs> over Germany. Three, he promoted the preparations for war. Four, he participated in the political planning and preparation of the Nazi conspirators for wars of aggression. Etc. Broadly speaking, the case against von Papen covers the period from the 1st of June 1932 to the conclusion of the Anschluss in March 1938. So far in this trial, almost the only evidence specifically implicating von Papen has been evidence in regard to his activities in Austria. This evidence need only be summarized now. But if the case against von Papen rested on Austria alone, the prosecution would be in the position of relying on a period during which the essence of his task was studied plausibility and in which his whole purpose was to clothe his operations with a cloak of sincerity and innocent respectability. It is therefore desirable to put the evidence already given in its true perspective by showing in addition the active and prominent part he played for the Nazis before he went to Austria. Papen himself claims to have rejected many times Hitler's request that he should actually join the Nazi party. Until 1938, this may indeed have been true, for he was shrewd enough to see the advantage of maintaining, at least outwardly, his personal independence. It will be my object to show that despite his facade of independence, Papen was an ardent member of this conspiracy. And in spite of warnings and rebuffs, 
was unable to resist its fascination. In the submission of the prosecution, the key to von Papen's activities is that although perhaps not a typical Nazi, he was an unscrupulous political opportunist and ready to fall in with the Nazis when it suited him. He was not unpracticed in duplicity and viewed with apparent indifference the contradictions and betrayals in which his duplicity inevitably involved him. One of his chief weapons was the fraudulent assurance. Before dealing with the specific charges, I will refer to document 2902 PS, which is on page 38 of the English document book. and I put it in as GB exhibit 233. This is von Papen's own signed statement showing his appointments. But I will read the relevant parts as they come. I need not read the whole of it. Beginning with paragraph one, uh, the tribunal will note that this statement is written by uh, Dr. Kubushok, uh, counsel for von Papen, although it is signed by von Papen himself. In paragraph one, von Papen many times rejected Hitler's request. Don't go too fast, there's a slide here. I'm I'm going to wait until they say that they've got the document. Papen many times rejected... Well, the light's on still. Go on. Papen many times rejected Hitler's request to join the NSDAP. Hitler simply sent him the Golden Party badge. In my opinion, Legally speaking, he did not thereby become a member of the party. Uh, interposing there, my lord, uh, the fact that he was officially regarded as having become a member in 1938 will be shown by a document which I shall refer to later. Going on to paragraph two, from 1933 to 1945, von Papen was a member of the Reichstag. Paragraph three, von Papen was Reich Chancellor from the 1st of June, 1932 to the 17th of November, 1932. He carried on the duties of Reich Chancellor until his successor took office until 2nd of December, 1932. Paragraph four, on the 30th of January, 1933, von Papen was appointed vice-chancellor. From the 30th of June, 1934, which was the date of the blood purge, he ceased to exercise official duties. On that day, he was placed under arrest. Immediately after his release, on the 3rd of July, 1934, he went to the Reich Chancellery to hand in his resignation to Hitler. The rest of that paragraph I need not read. Uh, it is an argument which concerns the authenticity or otherwise of his uh, signature as it appears in the Reich Gesetzblatt to certain decrees in, 19, in uh, August, 1934. I'm prepared to uh, agree with his contention that uh, his signature on those decrees may not have been uh, correct, may have been a mistake. He admits holding office only to the 3rd of July, 1934. He was, as the tribunal will also remember, in virtue of being 
Vice-Chancellor, he was a member of the Reich Cabinet. Going on to paragraph 5, on the 13th of November 1933, von Papen became plenipotentiary for the Saar. This office was terminated under the same circumstances described under paragraph 4. The rest of the document, I need not read it, concerns his appointments to Vienna and Ankara, which are matters of history. He was appointed minister to Vienna on the 26th of July, 1934, and recalled on the 4th of February, 1938. And he was ambassador in Ankara from April, 1939, until August, 1944. The first allegation against the defendant von Papen is that he used his personal influence to promote the accession of the Nazi conspirators to power. From the outset, von Papen was well aware of the Nazi program and Nazi methods. There can be no question of his having encouraged the Nazis through ignorance of the facts. The official NSDA, NSDAP program was open and notorious. It had been published in Mein Kampf. For many years, it had been published and republished in the yearbook of the NSDAP and elsewhere. The Nazis made no secret of their intention to make it a fundamental law of the state. This has been dealt with in full at an earlier stage of the trial. <coughs> During 1932, von Papen, as Reich Chancellor, was in a particularly good position to understand the Nazi purposes and methods. And in fact, he publicly acknowledged the Nazi menace. And take, for instance, his Munster speech on the 28th of August, 1932. Uh, this is document 3314 PS on page 49 of the English document book. And I now put it in as GB exhibit 234. And I quote the two extracts at the top of the page. The licentiousness emanating from the appeal of the leader of the National Socialist Movement does not comply very well with his claims to governmental power. I do not concede him the right to regard the mere minority following his banner solely as the German nation and to treat all our fellow countrymen as free game. Take also his Munich speech of the 13th of October, 1932. That is on page 50 of the English document book, document number 3317 PS, which I now put in as GB exhibit 235. And I will simply read the last extract on the page. In the interest of the entire nation, we decline the claim to power by parties which want to own their followers, body and soul, and which want to put themselves as a party or a movement over and above the whole nation. I do not rely on those random extracts to show anything more than that he had, in 1932, clearly addressed his mind to the inherent lawlessness of the Nazi philosophy. Nevertheless, in his letter to Hitler of the 13th 
25th of November 1932, which I shall quote more fully later, he wrote of the Nazi movement, and I quote, so great a national movement, the where merits is this? of where which... Is this? Where is this? Uh, this is in a letter which I shall quote in a few minutes, my lord. Uh, a letter to Hitler, 13th of November, 1932. <coughs> he wrote, so great a national movement, the merits of which for people and country, I have always recognized, in spite of necessary criticism. So variable and so seemingly contradictory were Parpin's acts and utterances regarding the Nazis, that it is not possible to present the picture of Parpin's part in their infamous enterprise, unless one first reviews the steps by which he entered upon it. It then becomes clear that he threw himself, if not wholeheartedly, yet with cool and deliberate calculation, into the Nazi conspiracy. I will enumerate some of the principal steps by which Parpin fell in with the Nazi conspiracy. As a result of his first personal contact with Hitler, von Papen, as Chancellor, rescinded on the 14th of June, 1932, the decree passed on the 13th of April, 1932, for the dissolution of the Nazi paramilitary organizations, the SA and the SS. He thereby rendered the greatest possible service to the Nazi party inasmuch as it relied upon its paramilitary organizations to beat the German people into submission. The decree rescinding the dissolution of the SA and the SS is uh, shown in document D631 on page 64 of the document book. And I now put it in as GB236. Uh, it is an extract from the Reich Gazette's blood. <coughs> which was uh, an omnibus decree. The relevant passage is in paragraph 29. This order comes into operation from the day of announcement. It takes the place of the order of the Reich president for the safeguarding of the state authority of the, and then the date there is a mistake, my lord. It should be the 13th of April, 1932. Which page of our book is it? Oh, I'm sorry, my lord, it's page 64. Are you, paragraph, what did you say? Uh, 64, it's paragraph 29 uh, of the particular decree. Oh, yes, I see it, yes. And the date shown there should not be the 3rd of May, 1932. It should be the 13th of April, 1932. That was the decree which had previously uh, dissolved the Nazi paramilitary organizations under the government of Chancellor Bruni. At the bottom of the page, uh, the tribunal will see uh, the decree, the relevant parts of the decree of the 13th of April reproduced. The beginning of paragraph one of that decree it said all organizations of a military nature of the German National Socialist Labour Party will be dissolved with immediate effect, particularly the storm detachments, SA, the protective detachments, SS. This rescission by von Papen was done in pursuance of a bargain made with Hitler. 
which is mentioned in a book called Dates from the History of the NSDAP by Dr. Hans Boltz, a book published with the authority of the NSDAP. And it is already an exhibit, US Exhibit 592. The extract I want to quote is on page 59 of the document book. And its document number is 3463 PS. I quote an extract from page 41 of the little book. 28th of May, and that was in 1932, of course. In view of the imminent fall of Bruning, at a meeting between the former deputy of the Prussian Centre Party, Franz von Papen, and the Führer in Berlin, first personal contact in spring 1932, the Führer agrees that a Papen cabinet should be tolerated by the NSDAP, provided that the prohibitions imposed on the SA, uniforms and demonstrations, be lifted and the Reichstag dissolved. It is difficult to imagine a less astute opening gambit for a man who was about to become chancellor than to reinstate this sinister organization <coughs> which had been suppressed by his predecessor. This action emphasizes the characteristic duplicity and insincerity of his public condemnations of the Nazis, which I quoted a few minutes ago. 18 months later, he publicly boasted that at the time of taking over the chancellorship, he had advocated paving the way to power for what he called the Young Fighting Liberation Movement. That will be shown in document 3375 PS, which I shall introduce in a few minutes. Another important step was when, on the 20th of July, 1932, he accomplished his famous coup d'etat in Prussia, which removed the brown, severing Prussian government and united the ruling power of the Reich and Prussia in his own hands as Reich Commissar for Prussia. This is now a matter of history. Uh, it is <coughs> mentioned in document D632, which I now introduce as GB237. It's on page 65 of the document book. This document is a, a an uh, I think it's a semi-official biography in a series on, uh, uh, on uh, public men. And Papen regarded this step, uh, his coup d'etat in Prussia, <coughs> as a first step in the policy later pursued by Hitler of coordinating the states with the Reich, which will be shown uh, in document 3357 PS, which I shall come to later. The next step, if the tribunal will look at document 632 on page 65 of the document book, the last four or five lines at the bottom of the page 
the Reichstag elections of the 31st of July, which were the result of von Papen's disbandment of the Reichstag on the 4th of June, which was made in pursuance of the bargain that I mentioned a few minutes ago, strengthened enormously the NSDAP so that von Papen offered to the leader of the now strongest party his participation in the government as vice-chancellor. Adolf Hitler rejected this offer on the 13th of August. The new Reichstag, which assembled on the 30th of August, was disbanded by the 12th of September. The new elections brought about a considerable loss to the NSDAP, but did not strengthen the government parties so that Papen's government retired on the 17th of November 1932 after unsuccessful negotiations with the party leaders. Well, I shall wish to uh, quote a few more extracts from that biography, but as it is a mere catalogue of events, perhaps your logic would allow me to return to it at the appropriate time. It would be more convenient. So far as those negotiations mentioned just now in the biography, and so far as they concerned Hitler, they involved an exchange of letters in which von Papen wrote to Hitler on the 13th of November, 1932. That letter is document D633 on page 68 of the English document book. And I now put it in as GB238. I propose to read a part of this letter because it shows the positive efforts made by Papen to ally himself with the Nazis, even in face of further rebuffs from Hitler. I read the third paragraph. I should uh, tell the tribunal that there is some underlining in the English translation of that paragraph, which is does not occur in the German text. A new situation has arisen through the elections of November the 6th, and at the same time a new opportunity for all nationalist elements to be concentrated anew. The Reich president has instructed me to find out by conversations with the leaders of the individual parties concerned whether and how far they would be prepared to support the carrying out of the political and economic program on which the Reich government has embarked. In spite of the National Socialist press calling it a naive attempt for Reich Chancellor von Papen to confer with the people concerned in the nationalist concentration, and that there can only be one answer, namely, no negotiations with Papen, I should consider it neglecting my duties, and I would be unable to justify it to my own conscience if I did not approach you in this matter. I am quite aware from the papers that you are maintaining your demands to be entrusted with the Chancellor's office. And I'm equally aware of the continued existence of the reason for the decision of August the 13th. I need not assure you again that I myself do not come into this matter at all. All the same, I feel that the leader of so great a national movement, the merits of which for people and country, I have always recognized, in spite of necessary criticisms, should not refuse to enter into discussions on the situation and the decisions required 
with that German politician who at present bears the full responsibility. We must attempt to forget the bitterness of the elections and to place the welfare of the country, which we both of us serve, above all other considerations. Hitler replied on the 16th of November 1932 in a long letter laying down terms which were evidently unacceptable to von Papen since he resigned next day <coughs> and was succeeded by von Schleicher. That document is D634, which I will put in as part of exhibit GB238, as it's part of the same correspondence. I need, I need not read from the letter itself. Then came the meetings between Papen and Hitler in January 1933 in the houses of von Schroeder and Ribbentrop, culminating in von Schleicher being succeeded by Hitler as Reich Chancellor on the 30th of January 1933. Referring back again to the biography on page 66 of the document book, there is an account of the meeting at Schroeder's house the uh, second paragraph on the page. The meeting with Hitler, which took place in the beginning of January 1933, in the house of the banker Baron von Schroeder in Cologne, is due to his initiative. And that means, of course, Papen's initiative. Although von Schroeder was the mediator, both von Papen and Hitler made later public statements about this meeting, press of, J of 6th of January 1933. After the rapid downfall of von Schleicher on the, si on the 28th of January 1933, the Hitler von Papen Hugenberg Selter cabinet was formed on the 30th of January 1933 as a government of national solidarity. In this cabinet, von Papen held the office of Vice-Chancellor and Reich Commissar for Prussia. The meetings at Ribbentrop's house, at which Papen was also present, have been mentioned by Sir David Maxwell Fife document D-472, which was GB-130. I now wish to introduce into evidence an affidavit by von Schroeder, but I understand that uh, Dr. Kubushok wishes to take an objection to this. Uh, perhaps before Dr. Kubushok takes his objection, it might help if I said quite openly that Schroeder is now in custody and according to my information, he is at Frankfurt so that physically he undoubtedly could be called. Perhaps I might also say at this moment that there would be no objection from the prosecution's point of view to interrogatories being administered to von Schroeder on the subject matter of this affidavit. Is there anything that you wish to add or not? Nothing I wish to add. Well, it's time for us to adjourn now and we will consider the matter. <laughs> yes, Mr. Bangton? My Lord, I lost. Uh, before uh, coming on to that affidavit, I last read a passage from the biography about the meeting at von Schroeder's house, <coughs> and I asked the tribunal to uh, 
deduce from that extract from the biography that it was at that meeting that a discussion took place between von Papen and mm -hmm. Hitler, which led up to the government of Hitler in which von Papen served as vice chancellor. So that now, at that point, the defendant von Papen was completely committed to going along with the Nazi party <coughs> and with his eyes open and on his own initiative he had helped materially to bring them into power. The second allegation against the defendant von Papen is that he participated in the consolidation of Nazi control over Germany. In the first critical year and a half of the Nazi consolidation, von Papen as vice chancellor was second only to Hitler in the cabinet which carried out the Nazi program. The process of consolidating the Nazi control of Germany by legislation has been fully dealt with <coughs> earlier in this trial. The high position of von Papen must have associated him closely and directly with such legislation. In July 1934, Hitler expressly thanked him for all that he had done for the coordination of the government of the National Revolution. That will appear in uh, document 2799PS. In, in fact, uh, although I shall read from that document in a minute, the document has been introduced to the court uh, by Mr. Alderman. Two important decrees may be mentioned specially as actually bearing the signature of von Papen. First, the decree relating to the formation of special courts, dated the 21st of March 1933, for the trial of all cases involving political matter. The tribunal has already taken judicial notice of this decree. The reference to the transcript is page 30 of the 22nd of November afternoon session. <coughs> this decree was the first step in the Nazification of the German judiciary. In all political cases, it abolished fundamental rights, including the right of appeal, which had previously characterized the administration of German criminal justice. On the same date, 22nd, 21st of March, 1933, von Papen personally signed the Amnesty Decree <coughs> liberating all persons who had committed murder or any other crime between the 30th of January and the 21st of March, 1933, in the National Revolution of the German people. That decree is uh, document 2059PS and is on page 30 of the English document book. I read section one. 
don't think you need to uh, read the decrees if you, if you summarize them. If your lordship pleases, I, I, I will ask you to take uh, judicial notice of that yes. decree. As a member of the Reich cabinet, Papen was, in my submission, responsible for the legislation carried through even when the decrees did not actually bear his signature. But I shall mention as examples two categories of legislation in particular in order to show by reference to his own previous and contemporaneous statements that they were not matters of which he could say that as a respectable moderate politician he took no interest in them. First, the civil service. As a public servant himself, von Papen must have had a hard but apparently successful struggle with his conscience when associating himself with the sweeping series of decrees for attaining Nazi control of the civil service. This has been uh, dealt with on page 30 of the transcript, the 22nd of November, in the afternoon session, and at page 257. In this connection, I refer the tribunal to document 351 PS, which is on page on page uh, one of the document book. It's US exhibit 389, and it is the minutes of Hitler's first cabinet meeting on the 30th of January, 1933. And I read from the last paragraph of the minutes on page five of the document book. <coughs> in the middle of the paragraph. The deputy of the Reich Chancellor and the Reich Commissar for the State of Prussia suggested that the Reich Chancellor in an interview would state at the earliest opportunity that the rumors about the danger of inflation and the rumors about the danger to the rights of civil servants are untrue. Even if this was not meant to suggest to Hitler the giving of a fraudulent assurance, at the best, it emphasizes the indifference with which von Papen later saw the civil servants betrayed. Secondly, the decrees for the integration of the federal states with the Reich. These again have been dealt with earlier in the trial. Page 29 of the transcript of 22nd of November in the afternoon session. The substantial effect of these decrees was to abolish the states and to put an end to federalism and any possible retarding influence which it might have upon the centralization of power in the Reich cabinet. The importance of this step, as well as the role played by Papen, is reflected in the exchange of letters between Hindenburg, von Papen in his capacity as Reich Commissar for Prussia, and Hitler, in connection with the recall of the Reich Commissar and the appointment of Goering to the post of Minister President of Prussia. I refer to document 3357 PS, which is on page 52 of the English document book. <coughs> and I now put it in as GB 239. In tendering his resignation on the 7th of April, 1933, 
von Papen wrote to Hitler, and I read from the document, with the draft of the law for the coordination of the states with the Reich, passed today by the Reich Chancellor, legislative work has begun which will be of historical significance for the political development of the German state. The step taken by the Reich government, which I headed at the time, is now crowned by this new interlocking of the Reich. You, Herr Reich Chancellor, will now, as once Bismarck, be able to coordinate in all points the policy of the greatest of German states with that of the Reich. Now that the new law enables you to appoint a Prussian prime minister, I ask you to inform the Reich president, and I would like to read also the, the uh, letter which Hitler wrote to Hindenburg in transmitting this resignation. Hitler wrote, Vice-Chancellor von Papen has sent a letter to me which I enclose for your information. Herr von Papen already informed me within the last few days that he agreed with Minister Goering to resign on his own volition. As soon as the unified conduct of the governmental affairs in the Reich and in Prussia would be assured by the new law on coordination of policy in the Reich and the states. On the eve of the day when the new law on the institution of Reich governors was adopted, Herr von Papen considered this aim as having been attained and he requested of me to undertake the appointment of the Prussian Prime Minister, when at the same time he would offer his full-time services in the Reich government. Herr von Papen, in accepting the commission for the government of Prussia in these difficult times since the 30th of January, has rendered a very meritorious service to the realization of the idea of coordinating the policy in the Reich and the states. His collaboration in the Reich cabinet, for which he now offers all his strength, is infinitely valuable. My relationship to him is such a heartily friendly one that I sincerely rejoice at the great help I shall thus receive. Yet it was only five weeks before this that on the 3rd of March, 1933, von Papen had warned the electorate at Stuttgart against abolishing federalism. I will now read from document 3313 Pierce, which is on page 48 of the English document book, and which I now introduce as GB240, about the middle of the third paragraph. This is an extract from von Papen's speech at Stuttgart. He said, in addition, federalism will protect us from centralism, that organizational form which focuses all living strength of a nation like a burning mirror onto one point. No nation is less adaptable to being governed centralistically than the German nation.
Earlier, at the time of the elections in the autumn of 1932, von Papen, as Chancellor, had visited Munich. The Frankfurter Zeitung of the 12th of October, 1932, commented on his policy. I refer to document 3318PS on page 51 of the English document book, which I introduce as GB241, The Frankfurter Zeitung commented that von Papen claimed that it had been his aim from the very beginning to build a new Reich for and with the various states. The Reich government is taking a definite federalist attitude. Its slogan is not a dreary centralism or unitarianism. That was in October 1932. All that was now thrown overboard in deference to his new master. I now come to the Jews In March 1933, the entire cabinet approved a systematic state policy of persecution of the Jews. This has already been described to the tribunal. The reference to the transcript is pages 1442 and 2940. Only four days before the boycott was timed to begin, 40. Uh, page 2940 of oh, yeah. the transcript. <coughs> yes. Only four days before the boycott was timed to begin, with all ferocity, to borrow the words of Dr. Goebbels, von Papen wrote a radiogram of reassurance to the Board of Trade for German-American Commerce in New York, who had expressed their anxiety to the German government about the situation. His assurance, which I now put in as document D635, and it will be GB242, on page 73 of the English document book, his assurance was published in the New York Times on the 28th of March, 1933. And it contained the following sentence, which I read from about the middle of the page. This document is the last but one in the German document book. Reports circulated in America and received here with indignation about alleged tortures of political prisoners and mistreatment of Jews deserve strongest repudiation. Hundreds of thousands of Jews, irrespective of nationality, who have not taken part in political activities are living here entirely unmolested. This is a characteristic the notice der New York Times geht zurück 
auf ein Telegramm des Angeklagten von Paten, das ein Blatt vorher in der Dokumentensammlung enthalten ist. Die englische Übersetzung trägt das Datum vom 27. März. Dieses Datum ist irrtümlich. Der deutsche Text, der mir übermittelt ist, zeigt, dass es sich um einen Wochenendbrief handelte, der nach den Zahlen, die sich auf dem deutschen Dokument befinden, am 25. März abgeschickt worden ist. Diese Zeitdifferenz ist deswegen von großer Bedeutung, weil tatsächlich am 25. März noch nicht das Geringste verlautbart worden war über den Judenboykott, den Goebbels dann für den 1. April angesagt hatte. Der Angeklagte von Papen konnte infolgedessen am 25. März auf die damals noch verhältnismäßig nicht allzu zahlreichen kleineren Zwischenfälle hinweisen, wie er dies in dem Telegramm tut. Jedenfalls entfällt dann aber die Schlussfolgerung der Anklage, dass der Inhalt des Telegramms eine große Lüge sei. Barrington, have you got the original of that? The original is, uh, is here, Lord, yes. It is uh, quite correct that there are some figures at the top which, though I hadn't recognized it, might indicate that it was dispatched on the 25th. And when was the, uh, uh, the meeting by the cabinet, of the cabinet, which uh, approved the uh, policy of persecution of the Jews? I can't say. I, uh, it, it was uh, sometime within the last few days of March, but it might have been on the 26th. I can have that checked up. Very well. Darf ich zur Aufklärung bemerken, dass die Kabinettssitzung, in der die Judenfrage erörtert wurde, wesentlich später stattfand und dass in dieser Kabinettssitzung von Kabinettsmitgliedern unter anderem von dem Angeklagten von Papen der Judenboykott verurteilt worden ist. Ich werde die, das Protokoll der Kabinettssitzung vorlegen, sobald meinem diesbezüglichen Antrag stattgegeben worden ist.
Uh, I don't know what you mean by your motion being granted. Uh, it's for counsel for the prosecution to say whether he persists in his allegation or whether he withdraws it. If well, he... I, I, will, I will say this. Uh, subject to uh, checking up the date when the, uh, when the, uh, the cabinet meeting took place, Well, you can do that at the adjournment and, and uh, let us know if, if your logic please, in the yes. morning. But I would, at this point, I would just say this, that it was, it, it was uh, as the tribunal has uh, already heard, uh, common knowledge at the time that the Nazi policy was anti-Jewish and Jews were already in concentration camps. So I leave... Uh, I, I will leave it to the tribunal to infer that at the time when that radiogram was sent, which I am prepared to accept as being the 25th of March, I will go further now I'm on this point. And I will say that von Papen was indeed himself a supporter of the anti-Jewish policy. And as evidence of this, I will put in document 2830PS, which is on page 37A of the document book, which I now introduce as GB243. <coughs> This is the last document in the German document book. Now I will read uh, paragraph four in the English text. Uh, I think it is paragraph five in the German text. It begins, the following, oh, this is a letter, my lord, written by von Papen from Vienna on the 12th of May, 1936, to Hitler, on the subject of the Freiheitsbund. Paragraph four of the English text is as follows. The following incident is interesting. The Czech legation secretary, Dohalski, has made to Mr. Staud, leader of the Freedom Union, the offer to make available to the Freedom Union every desired amount from the Czech government, which he would need for the strengthening of his fight against the Heimwehr. His only condition is that the Freedom Union would guarantee to take a stand directed against Germany. Mr. Staud has simply refused this offer. It is shown by that how one, even in the enemy's camp, already evaluates the new grouping of forces. From that, the further necessity results for us to support, as before, this movement financially, and namely, mostly, in reference to the continuation of its fight against jury. <coughs> I come next to the Ich muss hier auf eine Schwierigkeit hinweisen, die anscheinend durch die Übersetzung entstanden ist. Im deutschen Text des Originals steht bezüglich der Überweisung, dass mit Bezug folgende Wendung. 
mit Bezug auf die Weiterführung ihres Kampfes gegen das Judentum. Dieses Wort mit Bezug bedeutet hier, dass unter dieser Titulatur das Geld übersandt werden soll, obwohl dies nicht der eigentliche Zweck war. Denn der Freiheitsbund war nicht antisemitisch, sondern denn der wait, wait. österreichische Freiheitsbund war keine Antisemitenvereinigung, sondern eine legale Gewerkschaftskorporation, der unter anderem auch der, Vize der Kanzler Dollfuß angehört hatte. Dieses Wort mit Bezug bedeutet nur, dass die Überweisung des Geldes mit einer gewissen Firma versehen werden sollte, da man ja einer staatlich anerkannten Partei für irgendwelche Parteizwecke aus dem Auslande kein Geld überweisen konnte, wie ja das zurückgewiesene Angebot, wie ja das zurückgewiesene Angebot der Tschechoslowaken gezeigt hat. Ich will also hier nur darauf hinweisen, dass die Worte within Referenz vielleicht einen falschen Sinn ergibt und vielleicht besser mit Referring übersetzt wäre. Jedenfalls will ich lediglich erklären, dass es sich hierbei nur um eine gewisse Tarnung bei der Überweisung des Geldes handelt. Well, wait a minute. I don't know. I don't know which word you're referring to, but as I understand it, the only purpose of referring to this letter was to show that von Papen was uh, suggesting that a certain organization should be financially assisted in its fight against jury. That's the only purpose of, the, of referring to the letter. I don't know what you mean about uh, some word being wrongly translated. Ja, dadurch ist der Irrtum entstanden. Nicht zur Bekämpfung des Judentums ist das Geld überschickt worden. Denn dies war gar nicht der Zweck dieser christlich, christlichen Gewerkschaftsbewegung in Österreich, sondern es musste ein gewisser Titel für die Übersendung gefunden worden werden. Und diesen Gedankentitel der Bekämpfung des Judentums hat man gewählt. Der Zweck war also nicht die Bekämpfung des Judentums, sondern die Ausschaltung eines anderen fremden Einflusses durch geldliche Mittelhingabe, nämlich der Tschechoslowaken.
I should have thought myself that the point which might have been taken against you was that the letter was uh, nearly three years after the document, the uh, time with which you were then dealing. That is so, my It was not at the time of the previous one. Yes, I mean, the pre previous letter was in 1933, March 1933. Yes. And this was 1936. Oh, yes. I only put it in, my lord, to show that... Uh, Carried uh, by then, he'd already... By it. then, at yes. any rate. Yes. Oh. If, if your lordship has any doubt as to the translation, uh, I would suggest that it might be translated now by the interpreters. We have the German original, the photostat of the well, German original. Well, I think perhaps you can deal with that uh, tomorrow, if, if you think it necessary. You can have it uh, gone into again. I come now to the Catholic Church. The Nazi treatment of the Church has been fully dealt with by the United States prosecution. In this particular field, von Papen, the prominent lay Catholic, helped to consolidate the Nazi position both at home and abroad, as perhaps nobody else could have done. In dealing with the persecution of the church, Colonel Wheeler read to the tribunal Hitler's assurance given to the church on the 23rd of March, 1933, in Hitler's speech on the Enabling Act, an assurance which resulted in the well-known Fulda Declaration of the German bishops, also quoted by Colonel Wheeler. That was uh, document 3387 PS, which was US Exhibit 566. This deceitful assurance of Hitler's appears to have been made at the suggestion of von Papen eight days earlier at the Reich cabinet meeting at which the Enabling Act was discussed on the 15th of March, 1933. Uh, I refer to document 2962 PS, which is US exhibit 578, and it's on page 40 of the English document book. Uh, I read from page 44. That is at the bottom of page 6 of the German text. And the minutes say, the deputy of the Reich Chancellor and Reich Commissar for Prussia stated that it was of decisive importance to coordinate into the new state the masses standing behind the parties. The question of the incorporation of political Catholicism into the new state was of particular importance. That was uh, a statement made by von Papen at the meeting at which the Enabling Act was discussed prior to Hitler's speech on the Enabling Act in which he gave this assurance to the church. Which page is that on, on the in the document book? It's page 44, my lord, about the middle. <coughs> yes. On the 20th of July, 1933, Papen signed the Reich Concordat negotiated by him with the Vatican. The tribunal has already taken judicial notice of this as document 3280A, PS. The signing of the Concordat, like Hitler's Papen-inspired speech on the Enabling Act, was only an interlude in the church policy of the Nazi conspirators. A policy of assurances followed by a long series of violations which eventually resulted in papal denunciation in the encyclical 
mit Brennan der Sorge, which is 3476 PS, US Exhibit 567. Carpen maintains that his actions regarding the church were sincere and he has asserted during cross-examination, during interrogation, that it was Hitler who sabotaged the Concordat. If von Papen really believed in the very solemn undertaken, undertakings given by him on behalf of the Reich to the Vatican, I submit it is strange that he, himself a Catholic, should have continued to serve Hitler after all those violations and even after the papal encyclical itself. I will go further. I will say that Papen was himself involved in what was virtually if not technically, a violation of the Concordat. The tribunal will recollect the allocution of the Pope, dated the 2nd of June, 1945, which is 3268 PS, US Exhibit 356, from which on page 1647 of the transcript, Colonel Storey, read the Pope's own summary of the Nazis' bitter struggle against the Church. And if the tribunal will look at document 3376 PS on page 56 of the English document book, which I now put in as GB244, and which is an extract from Das Archiv, they will see that in September 1934, von Papen ordered, and I say ordered advisedly, the dissolution of the Union of Catholic Germans. Of which he was, at the time, the leader. The text of Das Archiv reads as follows. The Reich leadership of the party announces the self-dissolution of the Union of Catholic Germans. Since the Reich party leadership, through its Department for Spiritual Peace, increasingly and immediately administers all cultural problems and those concerning the relationship of state and churches, tasks at first delegated to the Union of Catholic Germans are now included in those of the Reich Party leadership in the interest of a stronger coordination. Vice-Chancellor von Papen, up to now the leader of the Union of Catholic Germans, declared about the dissolution of this organization that it was done upon his suggestion since the attitude of the National Socialist State toward the Christian and Catholic Church had been explained often and unequivocally through the leader and chancellor himself. I said that Papen ordered the dissolution, although the announcement says it was self-dissolution on his suggestion, but I submit such a suggestion from one in Papen's position was equivalent to an order since by that date it was common knowledge that the Nazis were dropping all pretense that rival organizations might be permitted to exist. After nine months service under Hitler spent in consolidating the Nazi control Von Papen was evidently well content with his choice. I refer to document 3375 PS, page 54, 
of the English document book, which I put in as GB245. On the 2nd of November 1933, speaking at Essen, from the same platform as Hitler and Gauleiter Terboven in the course of the campaign for the Reichstag election and the referendum concerning Germany's leaving the League of Nations. Von Papen declared, ever since Providence called upon me to become the pioneer of national resurrection and the rebirth of our homeland, I have tried to support with all my strength the work of the National Socialist Movement and its leader. And just as I, at the time of taking over the Chancellorship, that was in 1932, have advocated to pave the way to power for the Young Fighting Liberation Movement, just as I, on January the 30th, was selected by a gracious fate to put the hands of our Chancellor and Führer into the hand of our beloved Field Marshal, so do I today again feel the obligation to say to the German people and all those who have kept confidence in me, the kind Lord has blessed Germany by giving it in times of deep distress a leader who will lead it through all distresses and weaknesses, through all crisis and moments of danger, with the sure instinct of the statesman into a happy future. And then the last sentence of the whole uh, text on page 55, let us in this hour say to the Führer of the new Germany that we believe in him and his work. By this time, the cabinet of which von Papen was a member and to which he had given all his strength, had abolished the civil liberties, had sanctioned political murder committed in aid of Nazism's seizure of power, had destroyed all rival political parties, had enacted the basic laws for abolition of the political influence of the federal states, had provided the legislative basis for purging the civil service and judiciary of anti-Nazi elements, and had embarked upon a state policy of persecution of the Jews. Papen's words are words of hollow mockery. The kind Lord has blessed Germany. The third allegation against the defendant von Papen is that he promoted preparations for war. Knowing as he did the basic program of the Nazi party, it is inconceivable that as vice chancellor for a year and a half, he could have been dissociated from, from the conspirators' warlike preparations. He of whom Hitler wrote to Hindenburg on the 10th of April, 1933, his collaboration in the Reich cabinet, for which he now offers all his strength, is infinitely valuable. <clears throat> the fourth allegation against Papen is that he participated in the political planning and preparations for wars of aggression and wars in violation of international treaties. In Papen's case, this allegation is really the story of the Anschluss. 
his part in that was a preparation for wars of aggression in two senses. First, that the Anschluss was the necessary preliminary step to all the subsequent armed aggressions. Secondly, that even if it can be contended that the Anschluss was in fact achieved without aggression, it was planned in such a way that it would have been achieved by aggression if that had been necessary. I need do no more than summarize Farpen's Austrian activities, since the whole of the story of the Anschluss has been described to the tribunal already. Though with the tribunal's permission, I would like to read again two short passages of a particularly personal nature regarding Farpen. But before I deal with Papen's activities in Austria, there is one matter that I feel I ought not to omit to mention to the tribunal. On the 18th of June, 1934, Papen made his remarkable speech at Marburg University. I do not propose to put it in evidence, nor is it in the document because it is a matter of history. And in what I say, I do not intend to commit myself in regard to the motives and consequences of the speech, which are not free from uh, mystery. But I will say this, that as far as concerns the subject matter of Papen's Marburg speech, it was an outspoken criticism of the Nazis. One must imagine that the Nazis were furiously angry. And although he escaped death in the blood purge 12 days later, he was put under arrest for three days. Whether this arrest was originally intended to end in execution, or whether it was pr to protect him from the purge as one too valuable to be lost, I do not now inquire. After his release from arrest, he not unnaturally resigned the vice chancellorship. Now the question that arises, and this is why I mention the matter at this point, is why, after these barbaric events, did he ever go back into the service of the Nazis again? What an opportunity missed. If he had stopped then, he might have saved the world much suffering. Suppose that Hitler's own vice chancellor, just released from arrest, had defied the Nazis and told the world the truth. There might never have been a reoccupation of the Rhineland. There might never have been a war. But I must not speculate. The lamentable fact is that he slipped back. He succumbed again to the fascination of Hitler. After the murder of Chancellor Dolphus, only three weeks later, on the 25th of July, 1934, the situation was such as to call for the removal of the German minister, Reed, and for the prompt substitution of a man who was an enthusiast for Anschluss with Germany, who could be tolerant of Nazi objectives and methods, but who could lend an aura of respectability to official German representation in Vienna. This situation is described in the transcript at pages 478 to 489. Hitler's reaction to the murder of Dolphus was immediate. He chose his man as soon as he heard the news. The very next day, the 26th of July, 
he sent von Papen a letter of appointment. This is on page 37 of the English document book. It is 2799 PS, and it has already been judicially noticed by the tribunal. <coughs> Mr. Alderman read the letter, and I only wish now to refer to the personal remarks towards the end. Uh, Hitler, in this letter, after reciting his version of the, his version of the Dolphus affair, and expressing his desire that Austro-German relations should be brought again into normal and friendly channels, says in the third paragraph, for this reason, I request you, dear Mr. von Papen, to take over this important task. Just because you have possessed and continue to possess my most complete and unlimited confidence ever since we have worked together in the cabinet. And the last paragraph of the letter, thanking you once more for all that you once did for the coordination of the government of the national revolution and since then together with us for Germany. Perhaps that would be the time we might break off for 10 minutes. My Lord, I had just read from the letter of appointment which Hitler sent to von Papen on the 26th of July, 1934, the letter of appointment as minister in Vienna. This letter, which was of course made public, naturally did not disclose the real intention of Papen's appointment. The actual mission of von Papen was stated, frankly, shortly after his arrival in Vienna, in the course of a private conversation he had with the American minister, Mr. Messersmith. I quote from Mr. Messersmith's affidavit, which is 1760 PS, US Exhibit 57, and it's on page 22 of the document book. It's about halfway through the second paragraph. Mr. Messersmith said, when I did call on von Papen in the German legation, he greeted me with now you are in my legation, and I can control the conversation. In the boldest and most cynical manner, he then proceeded to tell me that all of southeastern Europe, to the borders of Turkey, was Germany's natural hinterland, and that he had been charged with the mission of facilitating German economic and political control over all this region for Germany. He blandly and directly said that getting control of Austria was to be the first step. He definitely stated that he was in Austria to undermine and weaken the Austrian government. And from Vienna, to work towards the weakening of the governments in the other states to the south and southeast. He said that he intended to use his reputation as a good Catholic to gain influence with certain Austrians, such as Cardinal Initza, towards that end. Throughout the earlier period of his mission to Austria, von Papen's activity was characterized by the assiduous avoidance of any appearance of intervention. His true mission was reaffirmed with clarity 
several months after its commencement, when he was instructed by Berlin that during the next two years, nothing can be undertaken which will give Germany external political difficulties. And that every appearance of German intervention in Austrian affairs must be avoided. And von Papen himself stated to Berger Waldeneg, the Austrian foreign minister, yes, you have your French and English friends now, and you can have your independence a little longer. All that was dealt with in detail by Mr. Alderman, again quoting from Mr. Messersmith's affidavit, and it is in the transcript at pages 492 and 506 and 507. Throughout this earlier period, the Nazi movement was gaining strength in Austria without openly admitted German intervention. And Germany needed more time to consolidate its diplomatic position. These reasons for German policy were frankly expressed by the German Foreign Minister von Neurath in conversation with the American ambassador to France. This was read into the transcript at page 520 by Mr. Alderman from document L150, US Exhibit 65. The defendant von Papen accordingly restricted his activities to the normal ambassadorial function of cultivating all respectable elements in Austria and ingratiating himself in these circles. Despite his facade of strict non-intervention, von Papen remained in contact with subversive elements in Austria. Thus, in his report to Hitler, dated the 17th of May, 1935, he advised concerning Austrian Nazi strategy as proposed by Captain Leopold, leader of the illegal Austrian Nazis. The object of which was to trick Dr. Schuschnigg into establishing an Austrian coalition government with the Nazi party. This is document 2247 PS, US exhibit 64, and is in the transcript at pages 516 to 518. Uh, it's on page 34 of the English document book. I don't want to read this letter again, but I would like to call the attention of the tribunal to the first line of uh, what is called the second paragraph in the English text, where von Papen, uh, talking about this strategy of Captain Leopold, says, I suggest that we take an active part in this game. I mention also, in connection with the illegal organizations in Austria, document 812 PS, US Exhibit 61, which uh, the tribunal will remember was the report from uh, Rainer to Bürkel. And it's dealt with in the transcript at pages 498 to 505. Eventually, the agreement of the 11th of July, 1936, between Germany and Austria, was negotiated by von Papen. It is already in evidence as TC 22, GB Exhibit 20. 
the public form of this agreement provides that while Austria in her policy should regard herself as a German state, yet Germany would recognize the full sovereignty of Austria and would not exercise direct or indirect influence on the inner political order of Austria. More interesting was the secret part of the agreement revealed by Mr. Messerschmitt, which ensured the Nazis an influence in the Austrian cabinet and participation in the political life of Austria. This has already been read into the transcript at page 522 by Mr. Alderman. <coughs> After the agreement, the defendant von Papen continued to pursue his policy by maintaining contact with the illegal Nazis, by trying to influence appointments to strategic cabinet positions, and by attempting to secure official recognition of Nazi front organizations. Reporting to Hitler on the 1st of September 1936, he summarized his program for normalizing Austro-German relations in pursuance of the agreement of the 11th of July. Uh, it is document 2246 PS, U.S. Exhibit 67, and is on page 33 of the English document book. And the tribunal will recall that he recommended, it's about halfway down that extract, he recommended as a guiding principle continued patient psychological treatment with slowly intensified pressure directed at changing the regime. And then he uh, mentions his discussions with the illegal party and says that he is aiming at cooperative representation of the movement in the Fatherland Front, but nevertheless refraining from putting National Socialists in important positions for the time being. <coughs> there is no need to go over again the events which led up to the meeting of Schuschnigg with Hitler in February 1938, which von Papen arranged and which he attended, and to the final invasion of Austria in March 1938. It is enough if I quote from the biography again on page 66 of the document book. It's about two-thirds of the way down the page. After the events of March 1938, which caused Austria's incorporation to the German Reich, von Papen had the satisfaction to be present at the Führer's side when the entry into Vienna took place. <coughs> Having just been admitted on 14th of February 1938, into the party in recognition of his valuable collaboration and having received the golden party badge from the, from the Führer. And the biography continues, at first von Papen retired to his estate Wallerfangen in the Saar district, but soon the Führer required his services again in that he, on the 18th of April, 1939, appointed von Papen German ambassador in Ankara. Thus, the fascination of serving Hitler triumphed once again. And this time, it was at a date when the seizure of Czechoslovakia could have left no shadow of doubt in Papen's mind 
that Hitler was determined to pursue his program of aggression. One further quotation from the biography on page 66, the last sentence of the last paragraph at one. After his return to the Reich, that was in 1944, von Papen was awarded the Knight's Cross of the War Merit Order with Swords. In conclusion, I draw the attention of the Tribunal again to the fulsome praises which Hitler publicly bestowed on von Papen for his services, especially in the earlier days. I have given two instances where Hitler said his collaboration is infinitely valuable and again, you possess my most complete and unlimited confidence. Papen, the ex-chancellor, the soldier, the respected Catholic, Papen, the diplomat, Papen, the man of breeding and culture, there was the man who could overcome the hostility and antipathy of those respectable elements who barred Hitler's way. Papen was, to repeat the words used by Sir Hartley Shawcross in his opening speech, one of the men whose cooperation and support made the Nazi government of Germany possible. That concludes my case.